the last game uh, always make you think of the first one. Uh, the first game I ever saw in Archer Ball was our game against Penn State my freshman year. I sat up in the stands with Ernie Davis's mother. The field was like a battleground. The force, the strength, the ferociousness of the hitting had me wide-eyed and scared even up in the stands. There had been many great games played here in Archibald and many great athletes. For all of us, those who made the headlines and those of us who did not, running through that tunnel out onto the field is a feeling that we'll never, ever forget. Goodbye to Archibald. You served us well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, years ago on the campus of Syracuse University, there set a stadium, and the stadium was called Archbold Stadium, stadium that was named after John D. Archbold, the person who brought oil and gas to America, man. And at the time, it was the largest gift ever presented to a university or a college in the United States of America, a football stadium. And out of that football stadium, some of the greatest games ever were played as Syracuse University to develop a great, fantastic, outstanding football program. The first time I saw a game at SU was back in the 50s. There was a guy named Jim Brown, oddly enough. It was against Colgate. It's the game he scored 43 points in. And we were playing the second oldest stadium, college stadium in the United States. My first recollection of Archibald Stadium is probably the first game I ever played there. Um, my freshman year, we played Villanova opening game, and actually I returned the kickoff. Syracuse is the only place I wanted to go. It was the epitome of big time football. I'll never forget my first experience at, at Syracuse as a freshman. We came into Archibald. It's the first time I had ever been in there as a player on that, on the grass surface. and you know, the smell of the fall in the air and football in the air, and you could hear the, the noise coming out of the other end where the, the varsity team was stretching, and we were, as a freshman group, stretching at the, at the other end, knowing full well that, you know, we were going to be Christians to the Lions kind of a thing. My memories are, are what I have. You know, I remember the first game in the Dome. I remember the first game in Archibald. I remember going out there being so excited. One end of it was the entrance was almost like going into a fortress and they had two towers and they had long steps leading up to it from Irving Ave and I, th I think it was good for a touchdown just to see the stadium for opponents. But there's one game I'll never forget. It was a game against the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland and the Syracuse University Orange football team because it was the last day the last game ever to be played at Archbold Stadium. Since 1907, the field had been home to Syracuse football. And on November 11th, 1978, the Orange men played their final game in Archbold Stadium against the United States Naval Academy. On the opening kickoff, Art Monk returned the ball from the five yard line and powered his way up the middle for a 35-yard return. The two things that I was looking for when I first came to Syracuse, New York, and I came up in September of 1970, the two things I was looking for was the Erie Canal and Archbold Stadium. I can remember 
watching the Ben Schwartzwalder Syracuse football show Thursday nights, black and white TV, you know, uh, and, and then it was Jim Brown, and it was Ernie Davis, and eventually it was going to become Floyd Little. And, of course, Syracuse had great teams, national champions in 59. Some of the greatest football players to ever put the uniform on played on this exact stadium, this exact field. People have asked me why I went to Syracuse, and quite frankly, when that's the only lady at the dance, that's the one you dance with. Syracuse picked up a quick first down. And on the ensuing second down and two, Joe Morris blasted through the Navy defensive line, shaking off tacklers as he scampered into the end zone for a 42-yard touchdown. Syracuse led Navy 7 to nothing. I liked Syracuse because of the head coach, and he promised that he would give me a chance to play as a freshman. I think the most important thing was this when I had a coach that I really trusted in Frank Maloney. Really thought he was very serious about winning. Well, Frank, you know, I'll always be indebted to Frank Maloney. I was a Division Three coach in Rochester, New York at Rochester Institute of Technology. So Frank Maloney gave me an opportunity to come back to my alma mater. Uh, Tom Compton, who was the offensive coordinator and a running back coach at the time, was somebody who taught me an awful lot about the game of football. Joe Morris was just an outstanding runner, a tremendous speed. Uh, when Joe came to us, it didn't take us long to get him on the field. I thought he was the most crazy man I've ever met in my life. I thought that this man was just trying to kill me. But it actually helped me when I got to the professional level. People used to look at Joe and think that, you know, well, well geez, Joe's a small guy. How's he going to? No, Joe wasn't small. Joe was short. Protected by a key Joe Morris block, Wilson ran into the end zone for the 24-yard score. Syracuse found itself ahead of the midshipmen by 14 at the end of the first quarter. Joe could run through you or he could run around you, and he was a guy that ran the old sprint draw as good as you'll ever see it. Joe Morris was, an, I remember against one team, they counted of the 11 defenders on the field on one run. He's zigging and zagging back and forth so many times. He broke, he broke uh, something like 10 or 11 tackles attempted tackles in this 40-yard run. It was just phenomenal the way he could just, he, he was so fast and strong. And uh, Craig Wolfley, this guy was talented. I always kidded Joe, I, I said, you know, if they ever took the bow out of your legs, you'd have been 6'2", but you know, he was only about 5'10", but man, he could really scoot. Probably one of my first trips coming out of White Plains, New York, uh, as a freshman and um, being on a big campus uh, was new for me. And I remember Rick Wright, and taking me around and, and showing me the stadium. He said, Professor, can I see the stadium? And I took the visit with my mom and uh, an aunt. Art came in, had a little leather jacket on that day. I don't forget, I was like, I hope this kid doesn't freeze to death, man. Art Monk was a <laughs> tremendously talented athlete. The thing that always amazed me about Art, Art could run forever. He had tremendous endurance. Art was probably the most highly recruited kid. You know, he could have went to Penn State or Maryland. To be honest with you, I was, I was going to University of Maryland. In fact, I even told him I was coming. Uh, and my mother engaged me one time and said, well, have you decided where you're going to go? I said, yeah, University of Maryland. And she looked at me and said, no, you're not. And I said, well, what do you mean? You just asked me who, where I decided to go, and I said, that's where I want to go. She said, yeah, but that's not where I want you to go. So she said, I said, well, where is that? She said, I want you to go to Syracuse. I think everybody knew Art was going to be a star. Art Monk, um, absolutely the, the best athlete I've ever played with. I remember going to Art Monk's apartment and seeing him in his apartment. And uh, I, asked, I asked the stupid questions like everybody else would. Art's there, he's there, and I asked him a question. I said, hey, what's it like? You know, is it harder, this and that? Just, just normal questions like a, a kid, a high school kid would ask. Is it, do they hit harder? Do they do this, do this and that? And the guy says, well, I want you to know Art Monk is the man right now. And he says, I don't know if you're the man, but maybe one day you will be. And I, and I kind of thought to myself, okay, that would be nice if I could come here and play. And I remember thinking to myself how great a player was. In fact, I think I threw to him one game. I think he caught 14 passes, and I think 13 were in the first half. And I told him at halftime, I'm not throwing you the ball anymore. Bill Hurley was a running back. Uh, who came to us from Buffalo, uh, New York, and actually rushed for 96 yards against Penn State as a freshman before we converted him that spring to an option quarterback. 
Uh, Billy was just such a talented athlete, phenomenal athlete. Uh, he, he, he was so good at so many very different sports, uh, and, and you could see the athleticism. Bill Hurley was, was, a, was a running quarterback. I mean, obviously he can throw, he, he, he was a great, great quarterback, but he, he liked to run the ball, and so as a running back, that's, that was our job. We were supposed to run the ball, and so on options, when he you know, dropped back and, and hit the corner, he's supposed to pitch the ball, obviously, when there's a man there, but a lot of times he would keep the ball. And so I remember one game, I just said, I'm not even going to look for the pitch. And so I just ran and blocked the, the corner of the defensive end, which allowed him to run and gain yardage. And you know, being in the, in the films the next day, and the, the coach said, well, Art, right, you're supposed to be there for the pitch. I said, well, he's not going to pitch it to me anyway. I might as well just run and block. We had won four straight games to finish the 77 season. We were all excited about the 78 season. We opened at home against Florida State. Bill Hurley's our highly touted quarterback by this time, uh, perhaps the best option quarterback in the country. He gets hurt in the first game. Joe Morris found his groove and continued his stellar first half with a 36-yard run, putting the Orange men on the 30-yard line. And then on third down, picked up another first at the Navy 15. However, a third touchdown was not to be, as backup quarterback Randy Edsel threw an interception in the end zone. And, and the whole season was just a, a, a series of frustrations. I think when you're hurt, you kind of feel like you're a fifth wheel. And so you're kind of cast aside until, uh, until you're ready to come back in. Um, that whole year was just such a, a tough time. Time ran out on the second quarter, and Syracuse would head for the locker room, leading Navy 14-3. The stadium, it had nice grass. It was a beautiful place. It was just an older, it's a just very older building. I said, what did the locker room look like? They said, Joe, you don't want to know. Well, our locker room, to put it mildly, was crappy. Well, you know, it, 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 was, it wasn't like what you, what you would expect in a major college. When I talked to contemporaries of mine that were visiting teams, they have nothing good to say about Archibald. Okay, now supposedly, in the visitor's locker room, there was a spiral staircase you had to go down to get to the field. Which only one person could go up or down. So you had to go up to take a shower, too, so it was, you were there forever. So that made for some interesting problem, shall we say, for behemoths to be climbing up this central, this uh, circular staircase. It couldn't have been a good sight going up or down for that matter. <laughs> you know, you, you're taken aback by some of the stuff that you see. And at one point, I do remember, uh, we're playing a game and we're in the Syracuse locker room and they had kept some dogs in a room right above our locker room. Now, Frank Maloney was our head coach. He was an Irishman. Now, Irishmen tend to get a little bit, you know, into it. They're a little emotional. So when he's giving the old Newt Rockney pregame speech, right, he's just whipping it up and everybody's getting it uh, And you hear the dogs start howling and they're barking rah, 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 like this. And you're like trying not to laugh, you know. And here's Frank. He's whipping up. We've got to beat these guys. He goes, oh, you know what I mean? It was all crazy stuff going on. You're like, whoa, this is like very surreal. It was more fun being out on the field than it was being in the locker room. The halftime ceremonies began with Floyd Little striding to the center of the field to oversee the groundbreaking for the new stadium and the fond farewell to Archbold. And they say, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our master ceremonies for today. Floyd Little, class of 67, the people went absolutely crazy. We didn't get to uh, see him. We didn't get to hear his speech. We just were focusing on the game because when you don't focus on the game, you lose sight of what's important. What's important is not about seeing Floyd Little. In warm-ups, me and a, and a friend of mine, were, we were looking at uh, Floyd Little and watching him stand on the sideline. We, we were just... You know, rather than paying attention to what we were supposed to be doing, warming up, you know, we were looking and talking about some of the guys standing on the sideline, and we got in trouble a little bit from our coach <laughs> for not paying attention. The third quarter saw Syracuse and Navy trading punts in a battle of field position. On Syracuse's next possession, Joe Morris again found the holes in the Navy line, picking up 11 and then 10 yards on back-to-back -back runs. Tim Wilson grabbed 15 yards on a quarterback keeper. And on second down, Morris picked up another first, putting Syracuse five yards from the goal line. But on the first play, Wilson tried to avoid the sack 
and pitched the ball into the hands of a waiting defenseman. Navy took over at the 11. Wilson's grief was short-lived as Leshinsky threw an interception on the very next play. Syracuse would have the ball back on the 23. When you visited Syracuse as a prospective student athlete, they took you right to the Carrier Dome. Whereas when, when I was being recruited, they did their best not to even drive anywhere near Archibald Stadium. Now the very first time I saw the stadium was on a recruiting trip and I saw it at about 50 miles an hour at about quarter to 12 at night. It wasn't something that the coaches wanted the kids to see. Well, when I was on my recruiting trip, it was snowing in Syracuse and so it was full of snow and the guy kind of went like, it's over there. In fact, they showed us drawings of a, an open air stadium that was supposed to be in place by 1978. Since um, the end of the Schwarzwalder regime, there hadn't been as much administration backing of the football program. So when I was a player, Archibald was the greatest place in the world. No, nobody ever told us any differently. We won a lot of football games. We won over and over against the best teams in the country. We never paid any attention. And nobody ever brought that up. But now there was this, this glitch, if you will, in the process. One more thing that had to provide was a hurdle, if you will, in trying to get a, a, a great high school player to come to Syracuse, and now it became a big deal. My first experience of actually walking into that place, I, I, I said, what is this place? I said, Joe, this is our stadium, this is where we play at. I go, you're kidding me, right? They go, no, this is where we play our home games. Had I seen this place when I was being recruited, and it was summertime, I don't think I went to Syracuse. With third down, Wilson tried to pass into the end zone intended for Art Monk but Navy's Charlie Myers came up with the jump ball. Navy then drove 80 yards down the field to score its first touchdown and bring the score to 14-10 at the end of the third quarter. Syracuse was not ready to go down without a fight and the Orange men worked their way up the field starting with a 19-yard Art Monk run. Tim Wilson then ran Syracuse back into the red zone with a 31-yard scamper. It wasn't until you got to see other school stadiums that you began to compare and kind of measure Archibald against, you know, some of the teams that we played against. Because when you go to other schools and you see the facilities they have, you know, every kid's going to compare that stuff. And, uh, and of course, once the, the promise of the dome was there, that could be promised going forward. But certainly, there wasn't going to be a lot of money put into Archibald Stadium at that time because the idea was uh, in moving forward that something was going to have to be done. Syracuse was knocking on the door again, but three attempts inside the 10 found the Navy defense stuffing Syracuse's runners. So, stuck with fourth down, Syracuse called in its leading point scorer, Dave Jacobs, to kick a 29-yard field goal. And behind Jacobs' boot, Syracuse increased its lead back to seven. I specifically tried to get into Lawrence and Hall for I don't know what reason, and I happened to get a room on a side that was overlooking uh, the stadium. It was, you know, fun to have a little entertainment just sitting at your window. And, um, but also being a filmmaker, I of course um, had my Super 8 camera with me and occasionally I would just uh, set up and shoot. With 10 minutes to go, Navy returned the ensuing kickoff 36 yards up the middle, and Navy started from its own 44. Leszczynski then hit tailback Mike Sherlock on a screen pass for 18 yards, and Navy marched down to the one on a series of quick plays aided by a penalty. Leszczynski then handed to Sherlock who took the ball the final yard for the touchdown. With the extra point, Navy had tied the game. Now you got Navy, a ranked team, and it's the last game at Archibald. There's a lot of pressure because of the history. I don't know that there was any pressure on us because of it being the last year that Syracuse University would play in Archibald Stadium. We had never gone through a whole season from the time we started in 1907 to 1970 out without winning at least one game at home. And the expectations from the university and from the Syracuse community was always one of pride and, and, and a winning tradition. Syracuse's struggles were mounting as the team failed to gain a first down 
and the punting unit was sent out with plenty of time on the clock for Navy to score. But the punter had other ideas. Grab the ball and tore up field for the first down. Syracuse had another chance. However, Syracuse found itself facing third and eight again when Wilson found Tony Sedor for the key first down pickup. After a 10-yard pass and three carries by Morse, Syracuse was in the red zone again. But again, the midshipman's defense stiffened. One yard away from Larry Zonka's archbold rushing record, Joe Morris was unable to gain that yard, and Syracuse was forced again to send on the field goal unit. And I can remember going out there and kind of looking up and just seeing Archibald Stadium was filled, and, and, and the color, and, 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 and the day was wonderful, uh, and it all happened so quick. Uh, and I was focused, and I knew that I was going to get a real good snap, I was going to get a great hold, and my job was just to kick it you know, through the uprights, at least get it down central. With 2.48 left on the clock, Jacobs booted a 30-yard field goal to give Syracuse the 20-17 to lead. That was that fantastic last drive of the game, and Navy marched all the way down to the end zone, and here it comes. And the Syracuse defense had to make a stand. First down, incomplete. Second down, incomplete. Third down, incomplete. The fans could sense the upset, but Navy had fourth down and one last chance for a touchdown. When the play started to develop, you could see we were in trouble just praying and crossing our fingers and, and hoping that, gosh, please give us this one game. I'm watching our players and they're trying to, you know, kind of hold off Navy for their last rally. The last play of the game, quarterback for Navy goes back to pass, ball into the end zone, right into the hands of a Navy receiver. And when the ball was in the air, you're thinking, oh my God, we're, we lost this game. I saw him there going to make the catch and you just, you just stop breathing. I remember thinking in my mind, God save us. And the kid dropped the ball. Mucho hugs all the way around is what it was. And Syracuse won the last game in Archbold Stadium. So the ball hits the ground, then you got zeros on the clock, and then we got more points than them. That, that was a defining, probably that and the uh, extra large pizza I had down at the varsity that night. Gosh, it was just, I mean, it was just exciting. So when you overcome these things and then you experience that little bit of joy at the end of the year by beating a Navy, a ranked team, by beating, uh, winning your first home game all season long against a ranked team and shutting down Archbold, uh, it, it's just unbelievable and indescribable. And so there was much joy that night in Mudville, I'll tell you. When I heard that the stadium was going to be shut down and torn down for the Dome, I also heard through the grapevine, at the end of the last game, the spectators were going to sort of initiate the destruction of the stadium. Uh, we weren't warned that it would happen, and obviously, you know, we saw everybody just coming out on the field. So I got all ready with the camera on the tripod, and uh, as soon as the game was over, started rolling and got some uh, great footage of the destruction. I just remember the, the, the mad rush afterwards. I remember people you know, breaking things down, taking wood. People were ripping up grass, people carrying, you know, benches and seats and... And my seat was number 41. We cut number 41 out and I still have it at home. Yeah, I barely got the scoreboard because, you know, they were really working it, working it, and of course a roll of Super 8 film was only three minutes and I probably only had one roll. That's where I was keeping my eye. I wanted to see that scoreboard just smash. Looking back and, and having a chance to really be part of history and not understanding it while you're playing it, knowing that it's the last game ever in such a storied football program, uh, and having a chance to be on the field uh, as a kicker. Uh, you know, I'm not on the field too much, but you know, uh, getting a chance to have the final points and be part of the kicking team and be part of the offense and part of Syracuse University football. And, and the biggest thing is being part of the fans that have, have came to Archibald over the years and you hear the stories that, 
you know, they came way back when, and, and uh, a lot of tears were shed for these guys and the girls and, and people, I should say. Uh, but that's really, other than academics and, and being on a field and part of a camaraderie, it's, it's a whole community. And, uh, and uh, Syracuse fans, uh, I have to say, are the greatest fans that I've ever come across because they're knowledgeable, everybody's got an opinion, and I'll tell you, you know, they relive the moments a lot more than you and I. The greatest of the game played at Syracuse, you know, the Floyd Littles, the Ernie Davises, and, you know, the Larry Zonkers and people like that. I played with Art Monk and Bill Hurley, and Craig Wolf. These are the people that taught me the game and taught me how to go out and play, and I watched them play. These guys really went on to have tremendous careers, and I'm extremely and, and humbly grateful and, and very proud of the fact that I got to play with them. Each was an individual in terms of his own personality, each a great guy in his own mold, uh, a, a really terrific guys to coach. And we ended up winning 20 to 17, the final home game in Archbold in that first win of the season to preserve a record that will be there forever. Syracuse had a great record in there. They won over 250 games in the time that uh, Archbow was our home field. As I look back on it now, even though it's not the way I would have taken, I'm just glad that it, it, it happened that way. There's only one place I wanted to go, and that was Syracuse. I'm glad my mom saw something that I didn't see. <laughs> so I'm glad she steered me in the right direction.